Welcome to another Sports Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, Matt's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. I hope everything's good with you. I'm up in uh, the Saratoga area uh, doing the show where I'm staying before I head off to the track. Not a bad thing, Matt. Not a bad thing. Unfortunately, uh, it was a tough week last week at Saratoga, and, I, and I'm sorry you had to, to be there for that. Of course, um, leading the way, let's get her photo up right now. Uh, Maple Leaf Mel, what a Philly, uh, New York bred daughter of cross traffic was lost tragically mad and, and probably one of the most tragic things we've ever seen in our lifetime of watching racing as she was uh, on her way to a another impressive victory in the grade one test stakes on Saturday at Saratoga when, uh, when tragedy struck. Yeah, that's, that's for sure, Brian. You know, we knew that it was going to be the biggest challenge of her career uh, in terms of racing, having won her first five starts uh, relatively easy and, 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 moving in moving from a uh, new york bread company into stakes company and winning a grade three but boy uh, uh uh in the race it sure didn't look like her toughest uh, challenge she seemed to be handling the race just like all of her others going right to the lead uh, uh dominating the race increasing her lead and drawing away as she went down uh, down towards the wire. Uh, she she was a fast horse, an extremely fast horse, a fast horse that loved to run fast. Uh, and and in a way, you know, uh, you know, not necessarily the same type of races and such, but in a little, in, in another, in a way, it kind of reminded me of, uh, uh, with everything that happened, it reminded me of Ruffian, who was another horse who was, fast was super fast and loved to run and, and i think uh maple leaf mel's trainer uh melanie giddings uh eventually f you know a day or so after uh the accident you know talked about that talked about this is the, this is what she loved to do she loved to run fast and and stuff happens and you know i i you do want to say that uh it, it is in an era where uh, breakdowns like this have gone down significantly and have trended downwards for the last five, six, seven years and advances have made, but things still happen. And, and it was a really tough day uh, at uh, Saratoga. Well, well said, Matt. Uh, yeah, uh, she, she was an amazingly fast Philly who who seemed to be doing things so easily and 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 this test was no different until her uh, until her going down so close to the wire at Saratoga on Saturday just a heartbreaking uh, story in so many ways uh, trainer uh, Melanie Giddings and, and owner Bill Parcells who of course famous for being the head coach of Super Bowl winning Giants teams uh, one of those things, like you said, you know, uh, fatalities may be down. It's still part of the sport, though, and it never gets easier. She reminds me of Ruffian, like you said, um, uh, from almost a half a century now, Matt, when Ruffian, that Philly with so much early speed, who proved her greatness. Uh, Maple Leaf Mel was on her way. Uh, Go for Wand, of course, probably was the worst thing I ever saw in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, eight bells in the Kentucky Derby, uh, just uh, 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 wonderful fillies over the years that have met tragedy. I don't, I don't know what it is about these talented fillies, more so even than the males, but uh, it hits hard, it hits home. We wish all the best to everyone who love Maple Leaf Mel. I also want to mention two other very nice female horses, uh, Sopran Bezalia in the Glens Falls and then Ever Summer also uh, uh, had to be euthanized because of races, uh, their injuries suffered in races at Saratoga last week. So we remember them. Um, it, it doesn't feel like enough 
not, but uh, we want to say our Horse Center version of goodbye. Rest in peace to Maple Leaf Mel and Eversummer and Sopran Vesalia. Uh, a, a sad circumstance last week at Saratoga. But racing goes on. We hope for the best. And uh, it, it's a nice weekend of racing around the country. We're going to go to Colonial Downs, actually, man. The first time I think we ever covered racing at Colonial Downs. It's also the first time that they had the trio of big turf races led by the Arlington Million. Uh, last year's edition was at Churchill Downs. This year it's been moved to Colonial Downs, which I think makes some sense. Um, I'm not saying I don't miss Arlington terribly, and I don't think it's a, a, a terrible thing that we lost Arlington Park, but uh, Colonial Downs looks like a nice place, a nice turf course to move this series on. Without further ado, we're going to jump into the Arlington Million, Matt, and this is a strange field, for lack of a better word, Matt. Uh, 11 horses. There's no superstars in the field. There's a, there's a handful of grade one winners. There's horses that pop up and win big turf races on the American turf scene recently. But um, maybe a horse or two that I feel comfortable not betting in here but then you got about nine others that would not surprise me if they won are you thinking the same thing i am in this grade one one million dollar mile and a quarter turf race yeah for sure brian uh it, it is a wide wide open field um and in these in this series of races uh in the past whether they have been at churchill or whether they when they were in Chicago, uh, Chad Brown ha has really, really dominated and won so many runnings of, of these races. But even but even the horses that Chad has uh, in the Arlington Million, and he's got he's got two in there. Um, they are not, in my eyes, the typical kind of Chad Brown horses that jump off the field and you say, "Well, they're going to be hard to beat." Uh, not so much. With, with the the two that are in there right in, in fact uh one of the chad brown horses at hamo is 10 to 1 on the morning line matt and, and the other chad brown horse rock emperor five to one so uh yeah you're right those are two horses who have shown flashes of really good turf racing since they've uh come to america they had some class over in Europe. Uh, Rock Emperor won the grade one turf classic in very impressive form almost two years ago. Won the grade two Bowling Green. But those big victories are few and far between Rock for Rock Emperor. At Hamo, uh, looked like a really nice uh, French import last this time last year. But he kind of went off the boil in his last two starts. And this will actually be his first race. I think both are threats in here, Matt. Both are talented, but you just don't know what you're going to get from either one for sure. Yeah, the, absolutely, Brian. Uh, um, they have flashed, like you said, nice, but uh, with both of them, their recent form is, is not particularly good. But then the other side of that is, I mean, it's really easy to say how often are you going to get a, a 10 to 1 on the morning line from Chad Brown and a 5 to 1. Uh, morning line on chad brown yeah it, it is a bit unusual um the done well in the million certainly done well in the beverly d and he could well do well here uh, on saturday in virginia but uh like we said wide open the morning line favorite there had to be a morning line favorite i don't know if i'm buying the seven to two clear favoritism on a tone matt but i i guess it's the only grade one winner this year Maybe he's the one that deserves to be the favorite in the million. I, I guess, Brian, like you said, somebody, somebody's got to be the morning line favorite as, as a line maker. You can't make them all uh, eight to one, although it would seem to be uh, uh, kind of fitting with this field. Uh, yeah, Atone won that Pegasus World Cup turf grade one back in January, but like we said about the Chad Brown horses, um, his last two starts have not nearly been up to that level. Not up to that level. Uh, he was fifth last time in the dinner party at Pimlico, although 
actually thought he ran a pretty good race on the lead there and just uh, weakened a little bit late, but he wasn't beaten all that much in a uh, kind of a scrum to the wire at Pimlico. He's another dangerous horse, but if you're telling me he's the favorite, he's probably not one that I'm going to jump on here as, as the chalk in this wide open race. Uh, let's look at the time form U.S. pace projector, Matt, to help us make some heads or tails of this tough race. Well, maybe. Uh, we, we see a fast pace in, in the 10 for a long turf race, and we see number seven strong quality out on the lead, but there's several here that they predict will be nipping at his heels, a tone being one of them, the four. Also win for the money, one of two for Mark Cassie. Then there's the defending race champion. We haven't mentioned it all yet, Santine. All of them very close early. Uh, I have to agree that uh, number seven strong quality is the speed of the speed. Also a Mark Cassie horse. And he's looked good in three turf races so far in his career. Yeah, I mean, it says fast pace. Uh, um, I guess, relatively speaking, a fast pace uh, for a mile and a a mile and a quarter turf race. We're not talking about sprinter kind of fast pace here. Uh, looking at the illustration of the pace projector, it kind of looks like one of those European fields where you got two distinct groups of horses and in here, and we've got the more forwardly placed group and the 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 the, the late uh, the late runners. Um, but still, all, this pace projector is. Uh, out in front of what we talked about uh, with a bunch of horses who are, you know, at this point, uh, inconsistent at best. Yeah, well, that's American turf racing right now. And, and number seven, strong quality. I, I'm pretty sure he is the the, the, the pace setter here. Uh, but I think it will be a stronger pace than we're used to in these distance turf races. We often see such slow paces in these races and i think with strong quality and those others it should be a solid pace here as time form us is kind of verifying um two horses that i mentioned as close to lead other than a tone matt uh let's talk about last year's winner uh satine satine is uh, a, a horse who's run really good races in fact he was a, a two-time grade one winner last year both of those wins came at churchill downs one of them in the Arlington Million. Um, he hasn't won this year, but on the other hand, he's not really been running on turf, and and he could pop up if he doesn't need to bring Churchill Downs with him. Yeah, that's an interesting thing about uh, about this horse that's eight to one on the morning line from the barn of Brandon Walsh, uh, um, and is that. His last two races were on the dirt. Uh, uh, he was fourth in a in, in a stake at Ellis Park. He was fifth in the blame, a grade three um, at the Churchill Downs. His one turf start was a fifth place finish in the turf classic, a grade one, also at Churchill Downs. Again, you know, uh, interesting move by Walsh, but his turf performance uh, uh, has you know, not been particularly great, but but he did win the million last year. Um, but as you said, it was again at Churchill Downs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I don't know if he's as good anywhere else than Churchill Downs. His recent form, his form this year does not look great, but I certainly can't throw him out. And with only one of those races on turf this year, I could certainly see him move forward. I, I, I'm not loving the 11 post mile and a quarter at, at Colonial Downs, but uh, we'll see, Santine, one you can't throw out. Another horse close, projected to be close to the early pace, a good early pace, is the eight, Catnip, Matt. And Catnip, I tell you what, if there's one horse who's becoming a real good turf horse, an American turf horse in this race, it could very well be Catnip. Catnip is a lightly raced four-year-old. He was a decent three-year-old last year. He's actually won at Colonial Downs, but uh, he's unbeaten this year, and he's looking better and better. Yeah, his 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 three races, his last three races this year, clearly have the look, make him a horse that has the look of one that uh, is enjoying being on the turf and in, and is getting better. Uh, he began with an allowance win at the Keeneland Spring Meeting, and then an allowance at Monmouth Park, stayed at Monmouth Park, and won the grade three 
mom mistakes. So um, we got we got some good past performances showing with this guy, which we certainly can't say about a lot of the other horses in the field. Yeah, he's the hot horse, Matt. And it, 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 despite that eight to one on the morning line, if I had to pick one horse to beat in this race, it very well may be the son of Kitten's Joy Catnip getting good. Brian Hernandez Jr. in the saddle. Uh, we still have a bunch to talk about, Matt. Uh, we haven't mentioned uh, the number two, Shug McGahey. He's got Never Explain going well, too. Uh, you talked about Catnip being one of the only horses with really good form coming in. Never Explain hasn't won his last two races, but on the other hand, it's hard to uh, argue with his recent form going back a ways for trainer Shug McGahey. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, uh, and most recently uh, was was third at, in the Bowling Green. Uh, uh, he was second at Monmouth Park uh, in that Monmouth Stakes. We mentioned that dinner party stakes uh, earlier in the rundown. Uh, Never Explained was the winner of that race uh, um, and also won an allowance at Tampa Bay Downs. So different tracks, running well, in good form. Uh, Shug clearly is recognizing that he's in good form and doing well, and he's running them. He's running them. He's run six races already, three wins this year. He's running them on short rest. Yeah. Bowling Green was only 13 days ago, and it was a slow pace for Channel Maker, the winner that day. So never explain ran a pretty good race, went third last time in the Bowling Green. Uh, we haven't talked about set piece yet. Set piece is another one, Matt, that – this horse has won 12 races in his career, both in Europe and America. He's been kind of a, a, a steady influence in middle distance stakes races for trainer Brad Cox since coming over to America years ago. Uh, this will be a stretch out, though. Ten furlongs. He's a horse who should benefit from a good early pace because he likes to come from way back. But I wonder if he'll have that same punch as he stretches out to a mile and a quarter. Yeah, that's for sure, Brian. And, and maybe on a little bit of a different uh, type of turf course at Colonial Park, a turf course that, you know, is thicker and, and, and is a very, very good uh, uh, kind of turf course. Um, but three top three finishes uh, in his last, uh, last three starts, including a grade three at Churchill Downs. Yeah, and you can't argue with those 12 wins in 28 career races for set piece. Let's get back to the Chad Brown horses real quick, Matt. Rock Emperor coming off a pretty bad-looking race in the Manhattan, and, and we're used to seeing Rock Emperor throw some kind of head-scratchers in, but he did have trouble that day. Certainly not out of the question with Johnny Velasquez jumping on board for Rock Emperor to, to uh, bounce back. Yeah, you know what, Brian? I think I've picked uh, Rock Emperor one too many times, and and I'm not getting back on the Rock Emperor uh, uh, bandwagon again. Yeah, yeah, he could pop up. Uh, it, it's almost like we're saying these horses take turns beating each other, Matt, and of course that's true with most of these good American turf horses. The number nine at Hamo, Flavian Pra, has been winning stakes races recently. I, I tell you, the one thing I like about at Hamo, Matt, is he ran some good races when he first got to America. He ran some good races over in France before that. Uh, grade one winner at Monmouth in the United Nations last year. His last two races of last year don't look good on paper, but they were 12 furlongs. Maybe he was going off a little bit. He's had some rest since then. And Chad Brown is a master at bringing horses back off the layoff. Yeah, you mentioned the winner in the United Nations. He was also second in the grade one Manhattan. And, and uh, yeah, if you're right about that, Brian, that uh, – uh, you know, he was just trending downwards uh, at, at that point. Chad's given him some rest. And, and if he's got him back in form, he's going to be dangerous. I agree. I agree with that. Um, one more horse, if we may. Well, well, let's go back to the Whitney because White Abario absolutely bombed the field in the biggest race last week. We haven't talked about it yet. Cody's wish was dull around two turns. It kind of got off to a shaky start maybe the assistant starter was holding him too long i don't know but uh kind of a dull performance by cody's wish but white abario might not have been beaten even if cody's wish had run his race white abario was making his second start for trainer rick dutrow 
masterpiece is making his second start for trainer Rick Dutra, another horse who likes to rally a little bit. He's got some class. He won the Eddie Reed, the grade two Eddie Reed at Del Mar last year. Might masterpiece follow that same pattern that White Barrio did last week? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and, and has a number of uh, this year, a number of top three finishes, uh, second in a recent allowance at Belmont that you mentioned, but a couple of uh, top three finishes on the turf at Gulfstream Park uh, in in graded stakes. Uh, Rick Dutro is a uh, uh, is the kind of trainer that is uh, a really really good horseman. He he uh, uh, knows how to deal with the little things that bother horses and get the best of them. Um, can he do it again here with uh, masterpiece? Uh, we'll see, but the odds are going to be good. The odds are going to be good. We saw Dutro, what he did for White Barrio. Masterpiece has not been far off. It could be his turn to win. He's not going to be my top pick, but Masterpiece is an interesting horse in this Arlington Million field. The good news, Matt, or maybe the bad news, if you like betting wide, wide, wide open races, the Beverly D is not quite like that. We're going to look at the Beverly D now, another grade one turf race. This is, of course, a mile three sixteenths, sixteenths shorter than the Arlington Million, $500,000 in this one's for the females, Matt. We only have a field of seven, but again, there's a bunch of potential winners in here. Morning Line Maker has decided Fev Rover, uh, Mark Cassie Import, who's run very well in five North American starts, most of them at Woodbine. Uh, they've decided that she is the horse to beat as the two to one Morning Line favorite. Yeah, I, I, guess, the, I guess that's okay. Um, yes, you mentioned that uh, uh, a lot of success at Woodbine on that wonderful turf course up there. But, you know, coming off of that third place finish in the Diana in a very, very, very strong Diana field, which is usually the case with that turf race early in the meeting at Saratoga, uh, uh, makes me feel a little bit about saying maybe Fev. Fev, Fev Rover is just a horse for a course at Woodbine. Uh, I think maybe she dispelled that uh, with her run in the Diana. Yeah, well, she was the horse I tried to beat in a time with in the Diana. And I tell you what, man, she ran a good race. White beam and in a time beat her, but she was beaten a half length. She was she just kept coming down the stretch. And like I said, only a half length beaten by white beam. And in Italian last time, I think she likes wet turf even better. Colonial's got a lot of rain last week. Keep an eye on the course condition because if Fev Rover gets a wet turf, I think she's even tougher as the favorite. Uh, Team Balor has a, I'm going to, I'm going to botch this, Romagna Mia. Romagna Mia had really nice form in Italy. She hasn't done as much lately. Johnny Velasquez is on her. An interesting horse, but uh, the the four to one morning line is not so favorable with me. Yeah, oh, I agree, Brian. Don't like the four to one odds uh, uh, with this Grand Motion train trainee. Uh, and typically, Brian, uh, Graham Motion with new European runners making their first starts in America doesn't have a very high success rate. I think it's around like 10 percent, 10, 12 percent. He's done it, but uh, uh, not frequently in graded stakes races. Yeah, and like I said, very good in Italy uh, going back in her form, but uh, not so good this year. I guess that's in Saudi Arabia and France. It'll be interesting to see if motion can turn her around. She's going to get some play. Grand Motion, Johnny Velasquez, but uh, a, a bit of a, a mystery. And I could probably say the same about the four. Jamie Spencer's coming in to ride. Uh, Mizancine. Mizancine has run in a lot of big races. She's run in the Breeders' Cup the last two years. She hasn't been winning much. Uh, she hasn't been winning this year. She was beaten last time in Allowance Company. But on the other hand, I can't throw her out, Matt. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree, uh, Brian. But the last two. Um... Pretty, uh, pretty unnoteworthy performances in allowance races, a fourth at Belmont and a second at Keeneland. Yeah, uh, good allowance races, high quality allowance races. 
but she's been not winning them. So we'll have to see. This looks like a tough spot for her to break through. Number five is a is a mare I've really fallen in love with, uh, Matt. She was uh, uh, showing some big things, to say the least, down in Argentina when she became a grass horse. She was ultra impressive in Argentina. And she's carried that form over in America. In fact, she's won four straight races until getting beaten last time. In fact, she had won eight straight turf races overall. Her name is Didia. Uh, last time I thought she was a pace casualty, but she still ran a good second in the grade one New York. Yeah, and, and right. I agree, Brian. Uh, uh, carried some ec excellent form from uh, Chile to uh, America. And, and and that doesn't happen very often. There, there's that significant class difference in racing usually takes its toll on these types. But yeah, that win streak snap uh, with a second place form finish in the New York grade one at Belmont. And again, that was a race that had a pretty strong field. Pretty strong field and no pace. So for her to be running, uh, to be running a strong second and to be gaining ground in the stretch to another good Chad Brown uh, mare, I thought was a very good performance in her first defeat in nine turf races, uh, in her last nine turf races. So Didia uh, certainly one to watch here. And as you look at this, they're saying not much speed again. Uh, I don't know if it'll be as slow early as the New York was, but there's just no proven speed horses. And the two favorites, Fev Rover and Didia, with uh, uh, Gina Romantica, uh, a Chad Brown mare we're going to talk about next, or Philly that we're going to talk about next. Three of the favorites, probably the three favorites in my eyes, uh, and they're the ones with the most speed in a race without much. Yeah, I, I, I always kind of chuckle when I look at the time form pace projectors and I see the, the gray button on there that says no speed. I, I, I get all kinds of images of the horses running backwards and, and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, and maybe they shouldn't have these streaks on the chiclets making them look like they're running fists. Maybe they should have round ones or something. Uh, but yeah, it, it certainly with the small field makes it uh, an interesting race uh, when there is not any speed uh, expected. I certainly hope no one's running backwards early, Matt. That, that would be a, a, a sight in the Beverly D. Um, interesting, though, that uh, Didia and Favreau were two horses not used to necessarily being on the lead are right up there in the time form U.S. pace projector. I think of the two, Didia might be more comfortable on the lead. She's at least done it before, and she's coming off that race where she handled it pretty well in the New York uh, now it's time to talk about Chad Brown, that big turf race, Beverly D, grade one females. We got to talk about Chad Brown, and there they are. Gina Romantica, the seven, Rocky Sky, the uh, Gina Romantica, the six, Flavian Prada board, Rocky Sky, the seven, with Tyler Gaffalione. Two different mares because Gina Ro Romantica was a grade one winner running shorter last fall at Keeneland, while Rocky Sky appreciated the longer distance late last year in new york yeah uh, um, and uh, a couple of uh, uh horses from chad brown you know not not big stars in the barn but a couple of interesting chad brown horses gina romantica uh uh had has had one start this year which was a fourth at uh at monmouth park but like you mentioned uh, she had a heck of a campaign a, a nice campaign last year winning the the QE2 at Keeneland and running second in the Pebble in the Pebbles in the Belmont at Aqueduct meeting. So uh, uh, an interesting Chad Brown, five to one at the morning line. Um, again, a, a nice price for Chad Brown. I'm not buying it, Matt. I don't think she's going to be five to one. I, I think she's going to be vying for favoritism along with Fevrover and Diddy. I think. Gina Romantica will be bet quite a bit more than that five to one. The Eaton Town, she got beaten in Eaton Town, but it was her first race back, and she ran pretty well, well close to the early lead. Uh, good fillies down there at Monmouth. Chad Brown again. 
I think she moves forward in her second race, and I think she's a threat here. But I'm not expecting five to one. You might get you might get a little bit more odds on the seven. The Rocky Sky, Rocky Sky, a little lesser known of all the good brown turf mares. But uh, again, running longer late last year, she looked good. But she's been away for a while. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, but last year, as you said, Brian. Uh, uh, going longer, this is a, a mile and three sixteenths, so a little bit of a longer uh, turf race. Uh, was second last year in the grade three Long Island and uh, won uh, another grade three at Aqueduct, the Belmont and Aqueduct meeting in the Waya Stakes. Um, this could be one of those ones that Chad Brown is known for that – comes back running off of a long layoff. Yeah, yeah. I talked about it in the, uh, the Arlington Million a little bit with Adhamo. Um, I also think that either one of these outside brown fillies are eligible to get better this year after showing some ability, some talent last year as younger fillies. All right, Matt, it's time. Let's get our top picks in. I'm going to let you go. Start with the boys. We did the boys first, so let's do the million. Who's your top pick there? Well, Brian, I'm going with uh, looking for some odds, and I think I might find some decent odds with the horse that we were describing as the hot horse, Brian. That's Catnip coming in off those three wins, a horse that we said looks like they're getting better. So Catnip for me. Yeah, eight to one on the morning line, Matt. Wow. I, I, I wonder what he'll be. I called him the horse to beat. He's your top pick. He's he's the horse I'm most afraid of for sure. Kittens Joy, there's not much not to like. If he can stretch out to 10 furlongs against grade one competition, I think Catnip has a big shot there in the million. I'm actually going with that Hamo. I still have faith that this is a really good horse. His record was a little bit uh, mixed, scattered, uh, some good, some bad last year. But I think he likes a little bit shorter than he was getting late in the year. As we said, we like brown horses off the layoff, and I think this race might set up well for at Hamel. I think he's going to have some good odds, too. He was 10-1 to 1 on the morning line. In the Beverly D, Matt, I am all over Didia. She's my top pick. I, I think this Argentine mare is really, really good. I, I can't knock any of her races. I think she'll be right there early, and I, I think she's a winner, uh, or she knows how to win, and, and I think she's got a big shot here in the Beverly D. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you, Brian. It sounded like you were giving me a little setup there uh, when you were talking about the Chad, the, the Chad Brown factor. I'm going with the Chad Brown factor in the Beverly D. I'm going to try Rocky Sky, however. Uh, I, I feel like this is one that Chad's going to have ready to fire a big shot first time out. And again, how often do you get Chad Brown at six to one or maybe a little bit higher yeah interesting pick and interesting matt that we uh in in the two different races we both picked a returning chad brown with some odds um catnip for you didia for me those might be the horses to beat in the million and the beverly d and they're not the morning line favorites so interesting uh interesting races here let me get a party shot from you before we head out yeah, these were certainly tough races, Brian, to be picking a favorite in. So uh, uh, they'll be they will be interesting to see. I I had a few horse center fans say hello at Saratoga. Maybe I'll get to see more of you. Um, and as always, folks, thanks for watching our show. Yeah, we we certainly appreciate watching every week, folks. Uh, that that's what makes us go here at Horse Center. We've been doing this a long time, and. And the fact that we get uh, hellos at the racetrack and great comments, uh, we uh, we certainly appreciate you more than anything. If you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, turn on those notifications. I also want to thank Candace Curtis in the home office for the race graphics, Timeform US for their pace projectors, and of course our sponsor, the best contest site out there, that's Derby Wars. Matt, uh, we will be jumping into more good summertime racing, but uh, once again, before we go, Rest in peace, Maple Leaf Mel. Uh, everything that we can uh, we can say is not enough, but uh, we uh, we wish all her connections the very best at this difficult time. We'll see you next week right here on Horse Center.